Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to this edition of the ICTS String Seminar, which today is joined with our new MadFizz seminar series. So today we are very happy to have uh, Shu Han Shao from Stony Brook, who will tell us about non-invertible symmetries from higher gauging. So Shu Han, over to you. All right, thank you so much for inviting me uh, virtually to this uh, interesting seminar. Um, yeah, so today I'll talk about non-invertible symmetry from higher gauging. Uh, the emphasis will slightly be more on what higher gauging is, as I will define in the rest of this talk. And before I start, let me just say that uh, please, please feel free to interrupt me anytime, anytime if you have any question. Um, especially given the Zoom format of the talk, I cannot tell. Um, how people are engaged uh, in, in the talk, and it will really help me uh, if there are a lot of questions. So this talk will be mostly based on uh, this upcoming paper with Rumpadakis and postdoc at UCLA, and Sahan Safnashri, who is an excellent graduate student at Stony Brook, who will join IAS in the fall. Uh, it will also be related to some of the work appear last fall, uh, one of them with my student Icho Choi and collaborators. There's an upcoming one. And uh, also on the same day, there was a very beautiful paper by Justin Cady, Kantaro Omori, and Yun Qing Zhen um, uh, related uh, on the same subject, but from a complementary viewpoint. And both of this work were, was in, were inspired by a very beautiful paper by Koide and collaborator where they did it on the lattice. Uh, since this is a Blackboard slash iPad talk, I won't be able to give a very complete reference uh, throughout the talk, so I have to apologize for that in the beginning. But let me just say that uh, this work that I will talk about, this one, um, is highly inspired by, by a lot of the uh, seminal work by Fuse Ronko Schreiger uh, almost 20 years ago. It's also closely related to the work by Kapustin Solina, but we will significantly generalize the story there. And more recently, these two papers are also relevant to, uh, to the topic. I will try to phrase everything in terms of a generalized global symmetry page. With that, let me get started. So this is a talk about symmetry. So what is a symmetry for a high energy physicist like me? Throughout the talk, I will be focused on relativistic quantum field theory. There are a lot of interesting symmetries on the lattice and condensed matter physics, but mostly my discussion will be confined to relativistic quantum field theory. 90% of the statement can be generalized to more general lattice system, et cetera, but let me not attempt to do that, given I, I was, I'm assuming that most of the people in the audience are from a more high energy or mathematical background. Now, what is a global symmetry in a relativistic quantum field theory? The modern perspective of a global symmetry is to characterize it in terms of the underlying topological operator or defect. Now that sounds like a fancy big word, so um, for People who are not familiar with this language, let me just elaborate this point uh, in the simplest possible example. Another comment is that throughout this talk, since I only be talking about relativistic quantum field theory and Euclidean signature, I will not make too much a distinction between an operator and a defect. I will use these two terms interchangeably. Now, what's the simplest example manifesting this statement? Just consider an ordinary quantum field theory with a U1 global symmetry that comes with a conserved Noether current. By conservation, we mean this equation. Given the conserved Noether current, then we can build a unitary symmetry transformation operator supported on some co-dimension one manifold in space-time and we integrate this current. This current is a vector or if you wish a d minus one form 
I'm sorry. All right, so let's unpack this formula a little bit. We have a vector that obeys the conservation equation. We can therefore integrate it on any co-dimension one manifold in space time. So here D is the space time dimension. This integral is the charge, the conserved charge of the global symmetry. Uh, it's very common to take M uh, to be the whole space at a given time. That's what we learn in uh, the quantum field theory textbook. And then the conservation equation tells us that the charge is conserved under time evolution. However, in a relativistic quantum field theory in Euclidean signature, there's nothing special about the time direction. So the conservation under the time evolution uh, is, will also imply that the charge is independent of the shift in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. More generally, the relativistic version of the time evolution, the time, uh, uh, the relativistic version of the conservation under time evolution is the statement that this charge is independent of the choice, but only depends on the choice of the manifold M topologically. It doesn't care too much about the detailed shape of your co-dimension one manifold M. And that's why a symmetry is naturally related to a topological operator. Okay, so this is a unitary operator labeled by a group element supported on a co-dimension one manifold in space time. Now, recently, the notion of global symmetry has been generalized in several different directions, and that's the main topic today. The so generalized global symmetry. There are many, many generalizations in the past decade or so, the, uh, one of the most famous one is the higher form symmetry. The Q form symmetry. Now, what is the Q form symmetry? The Q form symmetry is implemented not by a co-dimension one topological operator, but by a co-dimension Q plus one topological operator. I have a question. Yes, please. So when you are saying that this uh, manifold, this co-dimension one manifold is not just space, but can include some time as well. Uh, how is the conservation of the charge uh, brought about here? Right, so here D is the space-time dimension. So M is co-dimension one in space-time. Um, and the concept, and by the divergence theorem written here, uh, the charge depends only on the topology of this manifold, but not the detailed shape. So for example, if you have, if this is your manifold sphere, then you can deform it a little bit and that will not change any correlation function. So the statement is that you can insert this unitary operator in any correlation function you like. So maybe there's some other local operator, da, da, da. And this correlation function depends on this choice of the manifold topologically. And that statement uh, is nothing but the usual divergence here. Does that address the question? I'm just concerned about the fact that uh, you could have, for instance, a, a manifold, a co-dimension one manifold, which has a, which is just X, Y, and T, right? Yes. X, y and Z, you could have X, Y, and T. Yes. So, but that, that is something which is changing with time. Absolutely. So, so that go, goes back to my previous comment that throughout this talk, I'll be working with relativistic quantum field theory in Euclidean signature. So there's nothing special about the time direction, uh, but of course we can Vic rotate to the uh, Lorentzian quantum field theory. And let me take the manifold you chose uh, well, as an example. So you say, let's take N to be T, X, and Y at a fixed Z. In that case, this U is not an operator in Lorentzian signature. It is a defect 
extending in the time direction. It is a symmetry twist that modifies the Hilbert space. And I'm uh, discussing uh, both the operator and the defect collectively in Euclidean signature. But you are absolutely right, depending on which direction you take to be the time direction, this U might be an operator or a defect. If okay. it's an operator, it acts on the Hilbert space, untwisted. If it's a defect, it modifies the quantization and changes your Hilbert space. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Any more questions? Yes, uh, may I also ask a question? Yes, please. So here, thanks to the U1, uh, uh, thanks to the continuous uh, conserved current, you can prove that this operator is actually inv invariant under the smooth variations of the manifold. Yes. What would be the line of arguments for discrete symmetries? Do That's an absolutely postulate... fantastic question, yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you. So I would say in relativistic quantum field theory, for discrete symmetry, my definition is, the, is in terms of the existence of such topological operators. For me, that's the most invariant way to define the existence of a discrete symmetry. Of course, in explicit models with the Lagrangian, you can always, you can check that the Lagrangian is invariant under some discrete symmetry transformation, but in a complete abstract and invariant way, I would take the existence of such a topological operator obeying some set of axioms uh, to be the definition of having a discrete symmetry. Now, the details of those definitions and axioms satisfy the topological operator might depend on the space-time dimension, might depend on what kind of tangential structure you endow this manifold with. But to zero's order approximation, that's, that will be how uh, I define a discrete global symmetry. Uh, I see, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So yes, so those are about the ordinary global symmetry. Let's talk about a generalized one. The first one is a Q-form symmetry. A Q-form symmetry is not implemented by a codimension one topological operators or defect. Rather, it's implemented by a codimension Q plus one uh, topological defect. So let me write the codimension here. And because it's of higher co-dimension, it acts on a higher dimensional objects. For example, a one-form symmetry will act on the Wilson line in a gauge theory. This is the first kind of generalization. The second kind of generalization that we will encounter today is called a non-invertible symmetry. This might uh, be a less familiar term to some of the audience. What is a non-invertible symmetry? Um, a non-invertible symmetry is implemented by a topological operator, U, but U doesn't have an inverse. So for an ordinary symmetry or for an ordinary Q-form symmetry, it's always labeled by a group element G. And therefore there's always an inverse you uh, such that u times u inverse is the identity. But for general topological operator, there might not be such a u that uh, that satisfies this relation. So this go back to this arrow. So as I was advocating earlier, for every global symmetry, there should be a topological operator. But it's the converse true in the general quantum field theory. Is it possible that you have a topological operator that is not associated with any ordinary global symmetry? And the answer is, is yes, there are topological operator that doesn't come with an inverse and therefore it's not associated with any group-like symmetry. Okay. Now, uh, the non-invertible symmetry has a long history in one plus one DCFT, but recently um, in the last couple of years, starting with a work by Laksha and Tachikawa, and also a work by myself and collaborator.
it has been advocating that all this non-invertible topological operators should also be viewed as a generalized global solution. And indeed, they come with their generalized anomalies, and they are very useful in constraining renormalization group flows. In this work, we have derived various uh, non-trivial constraints on the, on the uh, strongly coupled dynamics in 1 plus 1D. Yes, yes. So uh, when you are saying that it doesn't have an inverse, yes. suppose you have this u theta uh, and you just say u instead of i theta, you have minus i theta. Wouldn't that act as, as the inverse? Oh, that, that's right. So sorry, I should have separated these two discussion more. This is for u1 global symmetry. Okay. Here I'm talking about some generalized uh, version of the ordinary symmetry. And precisely for the non-invertible symmetry, it's not labeled by a group. So you see, I didn't write any subscript here. Okay. Yeah, so this non-invertible symmetry is rather mysterious, but they are actually ubiquitous in 1 plus 1D. For example, in the I think conformal field theory, there's already a non-invertible symmetry. And in this paper, we have derived various non-trivial constraints on the RG flows from the non-invertible symmetries. And recently there has been uh, advancement in three plus one D uh, in this three papers, uh, deriving non trivial constraints from the non invertible symmetries. Okay, and there are many other generalizations, but today I will focus on this two, higher form symmetry and the non invertible symmetry. In particular, I will relate the two, relate this seemingly orthogonal generalizations of generalized global symmetry. So to motivate the talk, let me ask the following question, which is a question uh, that I have, uh, I always get when I give a talk on non-invertible symmetries. The question is, how common are the non-invertible symmetry? So, in the past four or five years since I've been working on non-invertible symmetry, this is the question I always get. Now, let me just say that there are a lot of familiar systems with non-invertible symmetry, the Ising model, the Maxwell theory, three plus one D, and even some three plus one D young mill theory all have non-invertible symmetries. But still in higher dimensions, in higher than two dimensions, it's not clear how common they are. And the punchline of the talk I'm giving today, perhaps the only punchline, is that we're going to give a positive answer to this question. And the answer is that the non-invertible symmetry are at least as common as the higher form symmetry. I have to add a parenthetical comment, which please, please feel free to ignore. So if you're really, a, really rigorous, then you should also add non-anomalous. But don't care, uh, you don't have to worry too much about this parenthetical comment. So what do I mean by this? This is the only punchline of the talk. What I meant by this is that in, in a fixed quantum field theory, if it has a higher form symmetry, then there's a way for me to generate or engineer a non-invertible symmetry for you in the same theory. You can think about this non-invertible symmetry as some kind of descendant of the underlying higher form symmetry, but it's an inevitable consequence of the higher form symmetry. And the process I'm doing here is what I will define as the higher gauging. Okay, so far this sentence is completely mysterious. I, I don't uh, expect you to, to, uh, to, to to find it illuminating, and that's the rest of the talk will be about. Uh, All right. Yes. 
I think I you make that. a much uh, stronger statement here. You can say that they're as common as uh, lower dimensional TQFTs. Uh, no, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. So you are right that in any fixed QFT, you know, just insert the lower dimensional TQFT as a defect, right? That's not generally non-invertible. However, if you just insert a decoupled TQFT, that's generally not going to act on any of the operators uh, in right. your theory. But so, for uh, example, if you have a gauge theory, then yes. you take a lower dimensional QFT with that global symmetry, and then you can gauge it to couple it to that gauge theory. That's right. That's right. That's, so you can also engineer it that way. But uh, the way I, oops, but the, the way that the, this non invertible symmetry obtained from higher gauging, they will have a natural action on the observables in your quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so that, that's the thing I'm going to talk about. Okay. But you are absolutely right. I mean, you can just take a decoupled TQFT, or in some cases, you can couple the uh, lower dimensional TQFT to your higher dimensional, uh, to your bulk system. And that generally will also give you non invertible symmetry. Completely. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, in the, <clears throat> now I'm going to introduce what higher gauging is. But before I talk about higher gauging, I should talk about the ordinary gauging. Of the Q form symmetry. Okay, so gauging the discrete, by the way, uh, I should say that all the global symmetries in the, throughout this talk will uh, be assumed to be discrete. I think the continuous generalization will be very interesting, but I don't have much to say at this moment. So what is gauge, what is gauging a discrete global symmetry in the whole space time? That's what we usually mean by gauging, mean. Well, as usual, when we gauge, if we gauge a continuous symmetry, we pass integrate over the continuous gauge field. But for discrete uh, symmetry, the gauge fields are discrete, and therefore we sum over the discrete gauge fields, which are in the cohomology class of our space-time manifold X. All right. So here uh, we are using a Q plus one form gauge, discrete gauge field because I'm talking about gauging a Q form symmetry. I'm going to assume all of my manifolds to be oriented, and then I can freely use the Poincaré duality to rewrite it as sum over defects, but now in the homology class. Here, gamma is a homology class of the appropriate degree where the topological defects implement the Q form symmetry is supported. So the upshot is that summing, uh, gauging uh, Q form symmetry in the whole space time is just summing over, summing over insertions of the co dimension. Q plus one topological defect. Okay. Now I hope this statement is not too controversial uh, because uh, let me just demonstrate that in the simplest possible case, let's consider one plus one D quantum field theory. And let me take a Z2 zero form symmetry, the ordinary Z2 symmetry and gauge it. Now, what does it mean to gauge a Z2 symmetry in one plus one D? That's just a familiar uh, orbifold. In orbifold, what do we do? In orbifold, let's say we are doing this on the torus, 
Then we sum over so I'm on the torus. We sum over all possible insertion of the Z2 twist. Divided by a half. The first time we twist it in this direction, then in that direction, and then in this last time we twist it in both directions. So this is the simplest case, simplest case of gauging, where you just sum over all possible insertions of your Z2 twist. As was already asked in the earlier part, in the beginning of the talk, when the twist is in the time direction, you can think about it as an operator. When it's in the spatial direction, it's a, it's a, uh, a twist in your Hilbert space. What do you mean by dry twist exactly? By a twist, I meant, let's imagine you have a scalar field theory for simplicity. This is a torus, so this is a S1. If I don't have a twist, that just means that I impose a periodic boundary condition for phi. But if I do have a twist, then that means as I go along the circle, I flip the sign of phi. That's the usual symmetry twist you can do on the Hilbert space when you do quantization. It's a twisted boundary condition. Does that answer the question? And what about the others? This is the operator. This means that you insert your Z2 operator U on your Hilbert space. And the other one, T2? That means you insert the Z2 operator on the twisted sector. I hope this is not controversial because this is literally what we do in ordinary orbital in CFT. The first two term project to the Z2 even sector of the untwisted sector. The last two term project to the Z2 even sector of the twisted sector. And the orbital theory is the sum of the Z2 even operators from both the untwisted sector and the twisted sector. Why can't the twisted, uh, why can't the trace uh, U uh, mechanism be uh, implemented by some boundary conditions as you have done for the others? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can you say again? The second one, you are saying that you are doing it by some twist, uh, by some trace over some. Yes. Uh, you yes why can't it be done using some sort of boundary condition oh you could you could but here i'm adopting a hamiltonian point of view i have already assumed this is the time direction this is the space direction and therefore this is an operator if you insist to do it in euclidean signature you can interpret uh, this term and this term on the same footing and then that expression will be related to the one i'm writing here by a Poisson resummation so it would amount to some anti-periodic boundary condition for in the time direction or something? That's correct, in the in Euclidean signature. Okay. And the two are related by Poisson reason. Uh, Does that answer the question? Question? Oh yes, please. Uh, yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, just uh, out of curiosity, uh, there is a known uh, duality in many cases between Chen Sinon's theory in 3D and uh, rational conformal field theories, including yes. orbifold. So can we interpret uh, uh, this gauging of a one-form symmetry in terms of inserting Wilson lines in Chen Simon's theory? Uh, summing over insertions of the Wilson lines in Chen Simon's theory, yes. Yeah. OK. So, so, these... so the short answer is yes. All right, I see, I see. In this example, I'm just reviewing the ordinary Z2 orbital in one plus one D, uh, but you are right that if I go to two plus one D, then gauging a one point symmetry will be summing over insertion of topological lines in, in the bulk space time. In the particular case of the transignment theory, that will be corresponds to inserting topological Wilson line in the whole space time. Thank you. Yeah. So that's for the ordinary gauging. Now let me talk about higher gauging. So what is higher gauging? By higher gauging, I mean I gauge, uh, again, discrete symmetry, a Q-form symmetry 
on a code dimension p manifold in space time. Notice that there are two integers at play here, q and p. So now I'm not gauging the whole system. I'm only gauging on a higher code dimension manifold. That's why I call it a higher gauging. Maybe you argue that it should be called lower gauging, but you know, higher gauging just sounds better. Now, here I choose p to be greater than zero. So since I'm only gauging on a higher code dimension manifold, I'm not changing the bulk of the quantum field theory. The bulk quantum field theory stays the same. But gauging it only on co-dimension p-manifold will engineer a new topological defect. So let me write it down. Does not change the Q bulk QFT, but it inserts a topological defect. of co-dimension P in space time. This defect will be called a condensation defect. I'm not going to justify the name in case some, uh, unless someone is interested in why, but this is kind of a terminology that has been used in the literature. So I'll just follow that. Just to be certain, uh, yes. are you saying that summing over the different uh, boundary conditions is equivalent to gauging the uh, discrete symmetry or something? Uh, is that what you're saying? So the way I define the higher gauging is by summing over co-dimension Q plus one topological defects. Over co-dimension P manifold in space time. So I'm working in a completely Euclidean picture. Uh, my question is why is that equivalent to a gauging in the normal, I mean, how is that analogous to gauging in the, in the continuous case? I mean, what, what is the relationship? What is the analogy? In the continuous case, you pass integrate over all possible gauge fields. That's a continuum. That's an infinite path integral you have to do. For discrete symmetry, there's only a finite uh, cohomology class you have to sum over. There are only flat connections. And the sum here by Pankare duality is the same as uh, summing over the defect. Again, this is really the standard orbital people develop in the 80s. Yeah, so how do you define gauging by a path integral? Just remind, just remind me. Uh, as I said, I'm defining the higher gauging as summing over the uh, topological defects on that manifold. In the special case, when it's a Z20 point symmetry on a torus, that's what I drew here. That's the no, definition. I mean, in the continuous case, you said that gauging is equivalent to summing over path integral. So how, how is that defined actually? I'm sorry, in the, continuous, in the continuous gauge symmetry case, I just meant that in usual QED, you pass integrate over the dynamical gauge fields. I'm not saying anything deep. I'm just saying that in QED, when we learn in textbook, the, the gauge field is dynamical and you have to pass integrate over it. That's how That's well we mean by gauging a symmetry. The summation is because of the discreteness of the symmetry, right? Absolutely, yes. Is there any other question? Okay. Okay. So this is what I meant by higher gauging. It doesn't change the bulk QFT, but it inserts a topological defect. And because we are summing over co-dimension Q plus one topological defect on the co-dimension P manifold, the dimension of this guy has to be smaller than that. And therefore the co-dimension has to be greater than that. So let me just write that inequality down. 
So higher gauging only makes sense if Q plus one is greater or uh, equals to P. Okay. Along with the notion of higher gauging, we can talk about higher anomaly. And by anomaly throughout this talk, I always meant to hoof anomaly, meaning that that is an obstruction to gauging the global symmetry. A Q form symmetry is called P gaugeable if A can be gauge on a co-dimension P manifold. Otherwise, it's P anomalous. And in particular, uh, zero anomaly is the usual to hoop anomaly, namely the obstruction of gauging an ordinary global symmetry in the whole space time. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. When you're when you're uh, usual, the usual definition of gauging is making a global symmetry local. That that's the usual definition of gauging, right? I, I think that's uh, that's not the most modern way to think about it. I think the right turn should be making a global symmetry dynamical, Mo making the background gauge field for a global symmetry dynamical, but go on. Yeah, so uh, here, uh, how, how is that coming about? Because when you, are, when you are summing over boundary conditions? Yes. Are, are you called? asking? Are you asking the usual OBIPO in 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 one plus one D? No, no. You are saying that this is equivalent to gauging the discrete symmetry. I'm, I'm so you are asking whether the Z two OBIPO is the same as gauging a Z two symmetry in one plus one D CFT? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Oh, uh, but then I, I, I'm afraid I have to refer you to the uh, standard literature in the eighties. That's a very standard uh, materials uh, people have developed. When uh, when they work on the one plus one d conformal field theory, there yeah. it was explained very clear why gauging a z two symmetry there is um, the same as doing the z two orbital. Yeah, if it's standard, then it should have a uh, it should have an explanation, right? I mean. Uh, yes, and I I think I have already given an explanation on this slide. And what is that explanation? The explanation is when you gauge a Z2 global symmetry, naively, the first thing you do is to project to the Z2 invariant sector, right? When you, in QED, the first thing you do is to throw away the gauging non-invariant operator. And that's the, what the first two turns are doing. It's projecting to the Z2 invariant operators. However, as was already not well known in the 80s, that's not enough. When you do gauging, when you gauge a discrete symmetry in one plus one d, you also have to introduce the twisted sector operator. Anyway, go. On. I have a question. Is yes. The, is the choice of this p manif p dimensional manifold uh, itself topological? Uh, so uh, yes. So here, because everything is discrete. Uh, when you do the higher gauging, you end up with a topological defect. So in the end, the choice of the P manifold is completely topological. Thank you. Yeah, yeah there's a very nice review paper by Ginsberg in the 90s, where he explained why this should be thought of as uh, gauging a Z2 symmetry. Okay, so what's the simplest case of doing higher gauging? The simplest case is to take Q equals zero and P uh, equals to one. Sorry, yeah. So when Q is zero, that means we're just gauging a Z2, uh, a zero form symmetry. And for simplicity, let me take it to be a Z2. So it's implemented by a co-dimension one defect U 
such that u square is one. That's an ordinary Z2 operator. But what does it mean to gauge it on a co-dimension one manifold? Well, u is already co-dimension one. So the higher gauging of a zero point symmetry is nothing but to sum over the Z2 elements. So we just get one plus u. But that's nothing surprising. That's just twice the projection. And indeed, the projections obey the non-invertible fusion rule. But we're never surprised by it because we know the projection is made out of uh, uh, the, the Z2 symmetry operator. In that sense, the projector is not simple. And that's true when, whenever the equality, inequality is, is saturated. So from this point on, I will only talk about the case when there's a strict inequality. In those cases, we will get the non-simple topological defects from higher gauging. Okay. So in this talk, I will talk about the simplest possible case of higher gauging. We'll be working with in two plus one D with bosonic quantum field theory. I'm going to choose Q equals one and P is one as well. So let me, let me just uh, prove to you that the inequality is still okay. And in the, our upcoming paper, we consider very general one form symmetry. But in this talk, I will only focus on gauging a Z2 one form symmetry. On a two surface in space time. And the outcome is a two dimensional condensation defect. So the condensation defect S now supported on a two manifold There's a no violation factor. It's the usual factor you insert when you do orbital in one plus one D. And you sum over all one cycles on your two dimensional manifold. And this eta is the topological line. It's the one form symmetry line. that implements the Z21 form symmetry. So this is the definition of the condensation defect. It's a surface defect. So even though it looks like a surface, it's actually made out of topological line. So you can think about it as a surface made out of lines. Okay. However, this expression is not always well-defined and that's what I'm going to talk about next. There's a higher anomaly in defining this thing uh, and we have to make sure there's no anomaly. So to talk about the anomaly, I have to first remind you what's the zero anomaly of a one form symmetry. And that's captured by the spin of the Z2 one form symmetry topological line. You can think about the topological line as the war line of an anion from a microscopic lattice model. And what, uh, as, as is famous in 2 plus 1D, the anion has fractional statistics. So you think about this direction as time, and you prepare two identical anions starting from here, and then you exchange them. Famously, they could, there could be a fractional phase compared to the configuration where the two anions just sit still. This is the theta, um, the, 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 uh, the notation is a little bit unfortunate. Theta is actually two pi i h, but that's standard in the condensed matter literature these days. The theta is called the topological spin. And having a non-trivial theta means that you cannot consistently 
uh, insert a mesh of all these lines. Because when you make such a gradient move, your correlation function changes by a phase. Therefore, this is the zero anomaly of gauging a Z21 form symmetry. This is the usual story uh, of gauging a one form symmetry in two plus one D, and it arises from braid. But now we are only gauging on a surface. We're only doing it on a two dimensional surface. So this configuration doesn't make any sense to us. We don't care about braiding anymore. Rather, we care about crossing. On our two dimensional surface, it could be that there's a locally, there's the configuration that look like this. And we can do a crossing move to bring it to this configuration. Both of them belong to the same homology class. And for the higher gauging to be consistent, we need this phase to be trivial. It's a simple uh, exercise to show that the phase here is the square of the previous one. For the experts, that comes from the hexagon identity. This phase is the one anomaly of gauging a one form symmetry on a surface. And that's a crossing phase. For Z2 topological line, what are the possible values of theta? It's not hard to show that theta to the fourth has to be one. So the allowed values of theta for Z2 one form symmetry is one i minus one minus i. And they have names. The corresponding anions for this guy is a boson, for this guy is a semion, for this guy is a fermion, for this guy is an anti-semion. For the Z2 zero form, one form symmetry to be zero gaugeable, namely for it to be free of the usual two group anomaly, then only the boson is free of the usual tip group anomaly. The other, since they have done trivial braiding, they are not zero gaugeable. However, if you only care about one gaugeability, if you only want to gauge it on the surface, then not only the boson is one gaugeable, but also the fermion. So we have more options because we're less ambitious. We just want to gauge, gauge the symmetry on the surface. Uh, hello. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, so, since you said it comes from the hexagon identity, I just want to know, is it, uh, can we state this in terms of like say some sort of braided tensor category or something like that? Like what is the statement here in terms of categories? In terms of category theory, you said? Yeah, yeah, I mean- that's Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, let, let me say, uh, you, you mean what, what are the, uh, I'm actually about to write it. So <laughs> zero gaugeable <laughs> means that you want the R symbols to be trivial. Okay. One gaugeable means that you don't care about R but you only care about F. Uh, what is F again? Uh, uh, F symbols. Oh, okay. R is the oh. usual R matrix, the Young-Baxter uh, R, right? So I don't know what R and F is. Maybe I misunderstood about that. Oh, sorry. I, I thought you were asking for a category. Yeah, category. Yes, yes. I yes. So the underlying structure of the a Z2 one point symmetry in two plus one D is de described by a braided fusion category. In the braided fusion category, there are two sets of important data. One is the R symbols capturing the braiding phase. Okay. The other is the F symbol capturing the crossing phase. They obey a oh, pentagon okay. identity and a hexagon identity. I got it, got it, I answered yeah. For it to be zero gaugeable, you want the R symbol to be trivial. And that necessarily will imply that F symbols are also trivial. Uh -huh. For one gaugeability, you don't care about R and you only demand the F symbols to be trivial. Uh -huh. yeah. This is the F, this is the R. Okay, okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so from this point on, I will only focus on one gaugeable Z214 symmetry. And that means my theta, the spin, is either one or minus one. It's either a boson line or a fermion line. Now we can revisit this formula, this condensation defect formula, and see what it looks like. For simplicity, I'm going to take the two manifold to be a torus. So I have A cycle and B cycle. Let me just plug in the definition. 
I have a one over two, one plus a dot a plus a dot b plus a dot a plus b. Notice that this formula is very similar to the famous D2 orbital formula in one plus one D CFT. But now the interpretation is completely different. Here we have a surface defect <clears throat> that's made out of the superposition of line defect on the surface. The only subtle term is this term. What, what is this term? This term is that you insert the Z2 line on the A plus B cycle. Now applying the braiding rule, this one, you can rewrite this guy as this, at the cost of a braiding phase. What is this? This is theta, eta B, eta A. More generally, you get an interesting non-commutative algebra. Eta on the, on the sum of the one cycles on the two manifold is theta to the gamma, gamma prime, eta of gamma, eta of gamma prime. For people who have th this, uh, uh, this structure is known as the quantum torus algebra. It has appeared in many different contexts in math and physics. For people who have work on 40 equals to two VPS state, this is actually a quantum torus algebra appearing in that context. I don't know the connection, but it's the same math. But now we are ready. So the punchline is that this term is theta eta b eta a. In the Z2 case, this happens to be the same as eta a eta b. Eta inverse to be more precise, but since theta is at most a sign, these two are the same. And now we are ready to compute the fusion rule of S. When it's a boson, we put plus one over here. And you find that S times S is two S, very much like a pr projection algebra. If you work a little bit harder on a general two manifold, this is the answer you get. S sigma times S sigma is square root of H1 sigma Z2 times S of sigma. Naively, you expect a number under the fusion rule, but you get a function that depends on the choice of the manifold. And what is this object? This is essentially the partition function of a one plus one dz2 h theory. So to conclude, what do we get here? When theta is the boson, when, when, we, when we start with a non-anomalous z2 one form symmetry, a boson line, we end up with a non-invertible fusion rule for the surface, for the condensation surface, where the fusion coefficient is actually a one plus one D decoupled TQFT. And I argue this, this is a general phenomenon. When you fuse, um, when you fuse topological defects, sorry, give me just one second. I need to, I need to plug my laptop. Sorry for the interruption. All right. Oh, uh, can you make the, I just joined with my iPad uh, through the internet. Can you make my iPad also a co-host? Sure, sure. Do it. Sorry about that. I thought my laptop lap battery can survive the whole talk. <laughs> now I have to plug it, I only have one wire. All right, thanks so much. Sorry about the interruption. Uh, can I ask a quick, Question. Yes, yes, this uh, is the perfect timing, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm a little confused about the uh, terminology non-invertible. So uh, th there's a notion of invertible and non-invertible uh, TQFTs, right? So- Oh, no, 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 no. So it's related, but not the same. 
Here, S is a defect in a bulk quantum field theory. The bulk quantum field theory need not be topological. It could be QEV, it could be Maxwell. But it's a statement that the defect in a QFT is non-invertible. Uh, right. So, but uh, is there something like observables built out of topological uh, defects? Do they obey the rules of a QFT? And is there some special property about that QFT uh -huh. that you're trying to describe? So for the ordinary global symmetry, then you are just asking what are the axioms for an ordinary global symmetry? And indeed, there, there's a full set of axioms that I didn't get a chance to go over in this talk. Uh, but in particular, here I'm only talking about the fusion data. But there could be more interesting data, such as the crossing data that we briefly discussed here. But uh, yes, the, the short answer is yes. And the full axioms and rules depend very much on the dimensionality. I see. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can give a whole lecture on that. But uh, today I just give the minimal data to get to the punchline. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, before we disconnect it, uh, I, um, the, the punchline is that starting with the non-anomalous uh, Z2 one form symmetry, you get a surface defect that obeys a non-invertible fusion rule. And the interesting thing about this non-invertible fusion rule is that the fusion coefficient is not a number, but full fledged one plus one DTQFT. And that should be a general phenomenon in, for the fusion of topological defects in general quantum field theory. You should expect a fusion coefficient not to be a number. This should be a fusion algebra over coefficients being TQFT. So for mathematicians, when you ask them what is a, a algebra, the first thing they answer is, uh, they, they ask is what are the coefficients? Is it over complex number, over real numbers, over integers, et cetera? And I will argue that the fusion of topological defects in quantum field theory should be an algebra over TQFT coefficients. What about the other case when it's a fermion? Then we put a minus sign over here and that makes all the difference. It's a simple one line algebra to show that in that case, you get a Z2 zero form symmetry. Okay. So I have maybe two or three more minutes because we started a little bit late. Yes. Uh, actually, how, how how many times, how much minutes would you need? Uh, not much. Uh, but I want to mention some outlook and connection to previous work. So you know, maybe five yes, minutes so... before then enough. Okay, then please go on. Okay, okay, I'll I'll wrap <laughs> it up. Now. Okay, so I just demonstrated for you that starting with a one gauge of a Z two one form symmetry, which can either be a boson or a fermion, you either get a non invertible fusion rule or you get a Z two zero form symmetry. So what are the examples? Let me just mention a few and I'll wrap up this talk. If you consider two plus one D Z two gauge theory, which is the low energy limit of the of Kitaev's Tory code, you know, it, it, we know it has both the boson and the fermion and the boson will lead to the non-invertible fusion rule we talk about. And that's sometimes discussed under the name of the Cheshire charge in the literature. In the case it's a fermion that leads to the Z2 ENM exchange symmetry uh, uh, in the Z2 gauge theory. The other example is the U1 transignment theory. In that case, you start with the Z2 N1 point symmetry, but only the ZN one point symmetry subgroup is one gaugeable. And then you get an interesting algebra. Let me just write it here. Um, actually, let me not do that. I'll, I'll do it later. And this then reproduced the algebra by Fuse at all 20 years ago and the one by Kapustin Salim. Okay. There's an obvious generalization of the above story to ZN one form symmetry. Then you get a much more interesting algebra. Let me just report it here. So for every 
little n and n prime, which are divisors of your capital N. As I'm assuming theta to be e to the two pi i k over n. Here, this k is an integer labels the zero anomaly. Then you get an interesting algebra that takes the following form. I should really credit to my collaborator, Sahang, working out all this complicated GCD that I have no intuition of, unfortunately. All right. So given a Zn one point symmetry, you can take any Z little n subgroup and consider its condensation defect. And they obey this generally non-invertible fusion rule. Here, this Z stands for ZGCD gauge theory. And when k is one, that reduces to the uh, fusion rules in U1 transcendence. So we generalize the result of Hughes, Schreiber, Runco, and Topolsky solid maps. Finally, uh, let me just make one more comment that you can do it in three plus one D. And that's my upcoming work with my student, Icho Choi, and other collaborators. And what's the relation between these condensation defects to the two papers from last November? So in the two papers from last November, uh, they, uh, we discussed the duality defect uh, coming from self-dual gauging. And the duality defect obeys the fusion rule of D times D bar equals S, where S is the condensation defect from a ZN one form symmetry. Um, so you can think about the paper from last year as taking the square root of the condensation defect. The square root always exists, but generally this D is an interface between the original quantum field theory and the one with its uh, one form symmetry being gauged. When, the, uh, when in the special case, the two quantum field theory are isomorphic, then D becomes a defect in the single theory. And in that case, you can actually have a full-fledged algebra that looks like the following. So let me consider the case of Z21 form symmetry so I don't have to worry about the bar. Then the full algebra is this. where the Z20 here is a two plus one D untwisted Z2 gauge theory. And all these defects are of co-dimension one. So you should really think about the condensation defect in this talk as a more elementary object compared to the duality defect. It exists for every system with a one form symmetry. Now in the special case, when the quantum field theory is self-dual under gauging, then you can take the square root and you enhance the algebra, the whole full non-invertible algebra to this. All right, uh, I think with that, I'll end my talk here. Uh, and thank you very much for all the questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Johan, for the great talk. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, uh, in general, so, so say for example, uh, I think for gauge theories, there is a one form of symmetry associated to the center of the gauge. Group. Right. Now, for what values of P is that P gaugeable? Uh, is that. Uh -huh. uh, so, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. So, it depends on the dimensionality. And let's say you are in three plus one D. Mm -hmm. And let's say you work with theory with fermions. By that, I mean, you know, I, let me not work with non-spin manifolds, just to simplify our lives. Then uh, for any ZN one form symmetry, ZN center symmetry, uh, they are zero gaugeable. So they can be gauged everywhere in the space time. And that implies it's P gaugeable for any positive P. 
So it's just a uh, so let me just mention one simple fact. If something is p gaugeable, I see. Then it's also p plus one gaugeable. So then zero gaugeable means it's gaugeable for all p. That's right. So in three plus one d, let's consider the spin QFD just for simplicity. Then all the ZN one point symmetry is zero gaugeable. And therefore, p gaugeable for all possible p. If you're on 2 plus 1d in bosonic QFT, bosonic QFT, then it depends. So all the z odd one form symmetry are, uh, are, are, sorry, are one gaugeable, but not zero gaugeable. And if you consider z even one form symmetry, Roughly speaking, half of them are um, one gaugeable. The other half is not. And that's a special, more general, uh, the special case is here. You see that for Z to one form symmetry, half of them are not one gaugeable. The other half are one gaugeable. I see. And yeah, I had one other question. So are there examples where, uh, this sort of generalized notion of a tooth anomaly, uh, it allows you to say, deduce the structure of vacua in the IAR when ordinary tooth anomaly somehow is not sufficient. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yes, there are many such examples. Um, starting from one plus one D in this paper of mine, we analyze a lot of two-dimensional flow. Yes. So for example, there was a flow from the tricritical icing model to two degenerate vacua. But that flow actually breaks the Z2 symmetry. So a priori, you wouldn't expect there to be any, the, the two vacua to be to arise from any global symmetry. There's no symmetry in that flow. Mm -hmm. And what we realize is that that flow actually preserves a non-invertible symmetry. And that non-invertible symmetry has a generalized notion of anomaly. And, the all, uh, and it's not compatible with, the, with one vacuum and the two vacua scenario is the minimal scenario that's compatible with that generalized anomaly. And then in three, and there was also a very beautiful paper by Sahan Safnashri, Zohar, and other collaborators, and Kantaro and Rupadakis, where they derive new constraints on one plus one D adjoint QCD using non invertible symmetry. Now, in this more recent paper of mine, uh, this one, uh, we found similar. Uh, RG constraints in three plus one D. And we use that to constrain the Z2 lattice gauge theory in three plus one D uh, or SO gauge theory. Yeah, so there has been a lot of uh, such applications by this point. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And so, and so here you focus mostly on the discrete symmetries, but do you expect something similar for continuous ones? That's an extremely interesting question. Um, it's not going to work on the nose because when you gauge a continuous symmetry, as was already asked uh, earlier in the talk, when you gauge a continuous global symmetry, you have to introduce gauge fields and you will have to pass integrate over uh, bound, uh, gauge field configuration with non-trivial connection. F mu nu is non-zero generally. So gauging a continuous global symmetry is not a topological uh, procedure. So it would not give you a topological defect uh, on the nose. But I suspect there's something similar one can do. I just haven't figured out how. That's indeed very interesting. I see, thanks. Yeah. Uh, not even for some churn Simons kind of actions. Yeah. Uh, what do you have in mind more specifically? Like, I mean, like continuous gate symmetries, but like you can say the churn Simon version or something, like not the F square kind of. Right, that, that would be the place that, that, that's the place I would start thinking about this question. Um, so, yes, you can do that, but generally, when you gauge a U1 symmetry, even in TQFT, you change the chiral central charge. So it doesn't lead to a topological interface or topological defect. There was a paper recently by a group of condensed matter physicists discussing gauging U1 symmetry in TQFT. 
As far as I can tell, uh, I, I cannot generate topological defect at this point, but that's something I've been actively thinking about. But that's, that's a very good question. I, I don't have a straight answer yet. But you are absolutely right that if anything should work for continuous symmetry, it should start with the case, we should start with the case of a TQFT. Um, Hi, was, um, was, um, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I have a question about uh, higher groups in this context. So usually we, we produce higher groups by starting with some mixed anomaly, right? So if yeah. we have some mixed anomaly and do a higher gauging, uh, do we expect to get some non-trivial, <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, some non-vertible operators with some non-trivial interaction, some non-vertible generalization of two groups in some sense. Uh, yes. Um, in fact, you don't have to start with a non-trivial two group to get to that. So let me, let me, uh, there's a story here I didn't get, get a chance to tell you. So let me, since you asked, let me tell you a little bit about it. So even if you start with a Z2 one form symmetry, and no, no two group, just Z2 one form symmetry, then it comes with a bulk line, eta. Um, let me make some space for me. There's an eta, there's a surface, the condensation surface, there's also one more thing. You can have a condensation surface, but with a line attached, uh, living on it. And together, these three objects form a non-trivial fusion rule. And this fusion rule, you can sort of think, think about it as a non-invertible two-group when it's a boson. So when it's a boson, the full fusion rule is here. Let me just quickly write it. This one we already encounter. Eta is a Z2 line, so eta squares one. Eta hat, on the other hand, is this. So there's a very non-trivial, non-invertible fusion rule. It's tempted to say it's a non-invertible two group, but it's actually a trivial two group in the sense that there's a proper Z2 one form symmetry. And what you ask is very interesting. Maybe you start with a non-trivial two group in the beginning, you might end up with uh, something more intricate. But I just want to make the point that even if you start with a one form symmetry on its own, already you are generating some kind of two group. And I think two group is not the right word here. I think the right word is that it's a fusion two category. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. That's an intriguing question indeed. And so, and so maybe this is a naive question, but um, since you call this like a higher gauging, yeah, uh, I mean, do you expect it to fit into some nice mathematical framework? Like, for example, these defects are the objects in some category, or yeah, but yeah, I do expect so. So yes, I think the um, general mathematical framework is the fusion two category, and here we didn't determine every data in that fusion two category. We just determined the basic fusion rule. But there could be junction or in the category language morphism. And that we haven't determined yet. But so this is for the Z21 or in general? Oh, we work out the the fusion for general ZN one point symmetry in two plus one D and also for ZN one cross ZN two. You might be curious, why do we bother to work out the ZN1 cross ZN2? That seems like a straightforward generalization, but it's actually not. It's because when you do higher, when you do ordinary gauging, you can add a discrete torsion. When you do higher gauging, you can also add a discrete torsion along the surface. And for ZN1 cross ZN2, you have the freedom of adding discrete torsion, but not for ZN. So there are some new uh, uh, elements there. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think the underlying math is very interesting. I, I'm not that fluent in the category language, uh, but I just want to work everything out from very down to earth physics approach. And I think it's even more exciting in three plus one D. I think all this fusion rule uh, with fusion coefficient being a T2FT, I don't know to what extent it has been discussed in math. And for all this algebra to be associative, and this one is relatively easier, but in our upcoming work, we have some more non-trivial one where the associativity of the algebra uh, is only true when you use non-trivial identities on TQFT. So you really have to know, these are not just some formal symbols. Their physics property, the physics properties of their partition functions are actually important for the algebra to be consistent. And in three plus one, there will be a fusion three category. And I don't know to what extent that has been defined properly in mathematics. But for me, you know, I just proceed as a physicist. In a lot of examples, we can write on explicit Lagrangians realizing all this algebra. But the full, the full mathematical framework is, is still beyond me at this point. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so it's kind of a vivid question. Uh, this uh, non irritable symmetries from higher gauging, uh, what it would imply um, in sort of abstract kind of way. Can you like uh, speak about that for a bit? Uh, by imply, you mean what kind of say dynamical consequence? Yeah, yeah. So I think the condensation defect itself, I'm not sure whether it has any new dynamical consequences other than the underlying, other than those from the underlying one form symmetry because there are really some kind of derivative objects from the one-form symmetries. So if everything you can learn about the one-form symmetry should imply what you can conclude from the compensation defects. However, the, its square root, such as the duality defect has dramatic dynamical consequences. And that was uh, one of the main points uh, in this paper last November. We used the duality defect to derive a lot of dynamical consequences. This talk was uh, the point of this talk was trying to make a case that there are more basic non-invertible defects. They might not be useful, but they are there and they're essential for, for building the full-fledged non-invertible fusion algebra. While them themselves might not lead to any interesting dynamical consequences, they may participate in the bigger fusion algebra that will give you non-trivial constraints. Furthermore, there are a lot of global, there's a question, there's a general question people ask, what qualifies as a global symmetry? And people give different definitions in different contexts. And some, one definition is that a zero form ordinary global symmetry has to act non-trivially on local operators faithfully. But that condition usually turns out to be too strong because take the charge conjugation symmetry in transignment theory, it takes A to minus A. That's certainly a good global symmetry, but it doesn't act on any local operator because there's, there, there is no non-trivial local operator in transignment theory. The charge conjugation symmetry rather uh, instead acts on the lines. It maps the Wilson line of charge N to Wilson line of charge minus N. So how should we think about all these global symmetries in TQFT, such as the charge conjugation symmetry? One punchline of the upcoming work with Sahan and Costis is that we argue that all the zero form symmetries in TQFT, they arise from condensation. Namely, all the surf topological surfaces, they are actually secretly made out of lines. And because they are made out of line, they are porous to the point operator. That's why they don't act on the point operator. Rather, they permute the lines. So that's another main point of the talk uh, of the project that I didn't get a chance to elaborate on. That we we elucidates the nature of global symmetries that act trivially on local operators. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.
Uh, I have a question about the statement that you made about zero form symmetries from one form symmetries in 3D. Yeah. Uh, so I so in TQFTs, uh, I think we can get all surface operators by condensing anions. Yes. And uh, but I thought that was strictly true, provided that there are no topological local operators. So do we oh, have? Sorry. A, is there a condition? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, you know, I've been talking to condensed matter physicists too often these days. So by two plus one D TQFT, I meant those TQFT that do not come with the local operators. Right, so right. more precisely, I mean stable TQFT without local operators in the condensed matter sense. Okay. So Chern Simon theory would be one example, but BF theory would not. By BF, I mean right, you know right. yeah, the two form gate. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Are there any more questions? Thank you, Wang. Very yeah. nice, uh, very nice talk. And oh, nice oh, talk. hey, Miguel, good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 a very naive question is uh, yes, you please. said uh, examples of, of tiers in 3D that are uh, not zero gaugeable but one gaugeable. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a very interesting general feature that a symmetry can be can be gaugeable uh, but not uh, like uh, yes. That's right. That's right. So that's so the question was: do you, do you have examples uh, in 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 other dimensions? <laughs> Because for that, uh, it was uh, crucial to know the, the <clears throat> fusion category, right? The, the structure of the R symbol, F symbol. Well, but, but if you say the words R symbol and F symbols, then we are in two plus one D. Yeah. So you are asking about other space time dimensions? Like three plus one D or four plus one D or-, or Yeah, or... right. So in three plus one, if you work with spin QFD, then every one of them, the ZN one point symmetry is zero gaugeable. Uh -huh. So you know you you are already good to go <laughs> from the top from the get go uh, yes level from the get go. Um, um, you can relax different condition if you consider non spin QFT. QFT okay. Then there could potentially be a anomaly, a zero anomaly for ZN one point symmetry when n is even. Uh -huh. And I haven't studied that yet. Okay. So for example, Maxwell theory can realize such an anomaly. And you can ask whether that anomalous one point symmetry in Maxwell in three plus one D. We yeah. know it's not zero gaugeable. We know it's zero anomalous, but is it one gaugeable? I don't know. I haven't yeah. studied that. That's that's indeed a very interesting point. Or you can consider Zn cross Zn, then you have more options. And also mm -hmm. I haven't studied that. Okay. I do want to emphasize one thing, which can, kind of is complementary to the point you just made, that in addition to anomaly, there could also be SPT. Mm -hmm. um, and here I did, for Z2 one point symmetry in two plus one D, I didn't talk about SPT. That is because on a surface, you don't have any SPT for a single ZN because H2 is trivial of a ZN. However, if you are getting a ZN one point symmetry on a three manifold, you do have a choice of the H SPT, and that's given by H3 of the uh, comma U1. So even though there's no interesting zero, uh, you know, there's no interesting example of one gaugeable symmetry that's not zero gaugeable, mm -hmm. you do have a whole collection of condensation defects labeled by the discrete torsion. So you could have like inflow from the bulk into these defects. For that's the not what I had in mind. That, that's not what I had in mind because here I'm saying that I have a three manifold. Uh -huh. And when I gauge on these three manifolds, I can turn on discrete torsions there. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want to do further inflow, you have to go down in one dimension more. But no, no, but I'm not having that picture. You know, SPT can be used in two different contexts. You might mm -hmm. be on the boundary, then it's the inflow. Or yes. it's the bulk SPT that you can use to gauge with discrete torsion. Here I refer to the ladder, but it's a discrete torsion on the three manifold, on the co-dimension one manifold. Mm -hmm. So you can 
call it the higher SPT, if you wish. It's an SPT on higher codimension map. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. In 3 plus 1D, there's no non trivial uh, one anomaly, so to speak, because everything is, is already zero gaugeable. But there are interesting one SPT. In 2 plus 1D, there are non trivial one anomaly or one gaugeability, but there's no non trivial higher SPT. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Thanks. Any last question? Okay, if not, uh, let's all thank Shohan for the great talk and discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the lively discussions. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so bye. I will end the, the meeting now. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Victor, for the invitation. Yeah, and for hosting this. It's, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.